If you were to publish a multiplayer game today, it's very likely that it would contain all four of these architectural components. And of course this list isn't exhaustive, maybe you're just playing around with some friends and it really doesn't matter. But if you're a new developer or are just starting on your multiplayer journey, this is a good place to start. The first component we'll look at is the connection. Each player that joins a multiplayer game establishes a connection with some server. This connection is how you communicate the actions that you want to take during gameplay, but it's also how you receive what the other players are doing. This is similar to ordering food at a restaurant. You typically don't talk to the chefs in the kitchen. You place your order with the wait staff who takes your request for food and brings it back to the kitchen where it's prepared. This is just like clicking a mouse or hitting a key on a keyboard. You're sending requests for actions back to some authority where those requests are processed. Eventually, food will be prepared and set down in front of everybody sitting at the table. This is pretty close to what happens in a multiplayer game. All of our button smashing for spell casts or weapon attacks are just requests sent back to a server over a network connection. And then the server will process those requests and synchronize those actions back to all the other players who are in the game. Just like how you see what everyone else ordered when the wait staff brings the food to your table, your weapon attacks will be shown to the other clients because the server told them about it. When a player establishes a connection to a server, we now call them a client. This client to server relationship is one of the most fundamental components in a multiplayer game. And if you want to learn more, check out this multiplayer video I made a couple weeks ago for a very basic example of this. You remember that scene in the Matrix where Neo's like, guns, lots of guns. And then Tank starts typing in a bunch of stuff on his computer and then a whole row of guns just flying in out of nowhere. That's pretty much how a database works. There's going to be a bunch of stuff stored somewhere, but in order to access it, you're going to have to make a request or a query for it. However, in this case, that would be a very inefficient query and would be considered bad practice. But anyways, in a multiplayer game, every time you loot a boss, we hit a database to get the available loot table that's associated with him. And that weapon you just picked up, well, somewhere behind the scenes, that weapon was saved to your inventory in some database. A database is used to store things like inventory items, maybe your stats or level progression, which bosses you have killed, what talents you have selected, maybe the cards that you have in your current deck. It's really anything that's important that may need to be recalled during gameplay about the player or the world. A good way to think about it is if the game servers crashed and you had to have your players rejoin the game, what information would you need to know to get that world and player back up and running? That's the information you save. And if you haven't seen The Matrix, well, What's wrong with you? Go watch it. Free your mind. Have you ever tried driving a car engine without a car? Yeah, of course you haven't. That doesn't make any sense. Well, do you remember the first section we talked about where we were establishing a connection between a client and server? Well, in order to do that, you have to take your server export build and put it somewhere so that it's accessible to the player base. You have to put the car engine in the car to be able to go somewhere. There are many ways to do this, but I covered the basics in my last video, so if you want to learn more, start there. Another option you've probably heard of is to create a P2P style game. This is where you don't connect to a server, but you connect to one of the players in the game who are acting as both a client and a server. We call that host mode. And it's also one of the easiest ways to get started when you begin testing your multiplayer functionality on your computer. When you're playing online, the game needs to know which inventory items you have, or maybe which cards you've selected for your deck, or maybe what PvP rank you have. But how would that be possible? First, the game needs a way to know who you are when you enter the game. If you've ever played online, you've definitely registered with a game launcher. Think Battle.net, Epic Games, or even Rockstar. When you sign up, they create a profile for you and associate it with a unique ID. But to make sure that it's you, they also make you create a username and password so that from time to time they can check and make sure you're actually allowed to have access to that account. In other words, they authenticate you. And when they need to access inventory items, they use that unique ID to make sure that they're retrieving the correct items out of the database. Authentication not only keeps our account secure, it also helps us correctly retrieve or save player specific data. You may not need to incorporate everything I covered in this video, at least not in the beginning, but it should give you a pretty good idea or plan on what to expect when you're ready to publish your game. I barely scratched the surface on each of these topics, so if you'd like me to do some deeper dives on them, I can certainly do that. Just let me know down in the comments. 
If you like this video, please like and subscribe. It is greatly appreciated. Stay connected. Thanks for watching.